Um, on behalf of the MIT Activities Committee, I want to welcome everybody today to the um, Beauty and History of Lighthouses uh, talk today with Rick uh, Kohler from the Friends of the Wood Island Lighthouse. Um, we're so thrilled to have Rick here today, who's a true you know, lighthouse enthusiast, um, and he's going to talk about the history of lighthouses um, from er very early um, Roman days to current day, day marks on lighthouses, um, friend, friends no lenses, um, and how they um, were used with the lighthouses, and also go through some of the, the history um, uh, and the specific lighthouses of New Jersey and New England. Um, so without further ado, um, I want to welcome Rick and um, I'm going to have you take it away from here. So thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you, Diane, and I'm very happy to be here. I am a lighthouse enthusiast, and I do enjoy talking about lighthouses, and I have given this presentation before. So let's move right into it, and we can talk about uh, lighthouses right from the beginning of time. It is very rare in the time of humans building anything that they hit the apex the first time out of the gate. But humans did do that when they built the Pharos of Alexandria about 2,300 years ago. Now, no one really knows when the first fire was built on shore in order to lead uh, fishermen home again. But this was uh, done at the times of Alexander the Great and it was used in order to lead ships uh, through the Mediterranean to Alexandria, Egypt. Now, as I said, this is the apex. This is the greatest lighthouse that was ever built. It is the tallest, about 40 stories, but it was built 40 stories tall, uh, tall for a reason, and that is because of optics. They did not have optics in those days that were able to uh, send a light far out to sea, so they had to do it by height. So this, as I said, was constructed about 2,300 years ago. Uh, as I said, 40 stories, and it had a fire on the top of it with a reflective mirror that intensified it in order to send the light about 35 miles out to sea in order to guide ships into Alexandria. And this lighthouse uh, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it does not exist today except in rubble in Alexandria, Egypt, but it is uh, still a great achievement in the uh, construction of lighthouse and actually in those days, construction of anything. Now, the light was extinguished in uh, 64 AD, so it did shine for about 800 years before it was extinguished, and the tower itself did stand until the early 1300s when there were two earthquakes which did destroy the lighthouse, leaving it in ruins in the, uh, in, in the harbor. What you see here is from my collection of lighthouses, this is uh, a copy of what the Pharaohs at Alexandria did look like. We do know what it did look like because uh, even though there are no photographs, obviously, there are many people who did uh, draw it, who did take dimensions. Uh, and so we know the exact height, we know the exact size, we know what it looked like, and this is a replica of it. There's a statue of Poseidon on the top and other Greek gods were uh, on there because obviously, as you know, Alexander the Great was, uh, was from Greece. This is his empire. And Alexandria is located right down at this point in what is today Egypt. But his empire began in Greece and then it spread it eastward. Right here we have uh, a list of the seven wonders of the world because I know some people are thinking about it right now. What were the seven wonders of the world? I'm not going to be talking about them at all other than the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, as you probably know, that is the only one of the seven wonders of the world which still exists today. Now, moving on 
we go through a history, we come to the Tower of Hercules, which is on the Atlantic coast of Spain, north of Portugal. The Tower of Hercules was of Roman origin. It was, as you know, the Romans did move out around the uh, uh, Mediterranean and out into the Atlantic and eventually over to England, which is where we're gonna go next after this. But they did build lighthouses along the way too. Now this lighthouse was constructed second century AD and it was used for about 300 years before it went dark. It was relit in uh, 1682 after 1200 years of being dark and it is still being used today. It had a modern renovation and uh, renovation in 1791 uh, and it had an oil lamp in it, which was installed in 1847 with a Fresnel lens. I'm going to be getting into Fresnel lens shortly, but when they were invented in 1822, that changed lighthouses for everybody and forever because it now allowed the light in the lighthouse to be focused in one direction. And as I said, I will get into that in just a moment. This is another Roman lighthouse. This is Dover Castle in England. There were two towers that were built at this castle. The only one tower survives today. The second one, there are ruins of it, but this was a lighthouse. And actually there were two lighthouses there, which was not uncommon in those days. And really more common than you may think in our own day. And I will talk about some of the double lighthouses as we go along. Going on into Daymarks. Before I go into that though, are there any questions, Fufi, that has come up at this point? Uh, not just yet, but uh, I will keep an eye on it and let you know. Okay. Daymarks. Daymarks are very interesting on lighthouses because they are patterns which are painted on the side which separate that lighthouse from other lighthouses in the area in the daytime because you were able to see uh, the unique patterns that are painted there. And that allows the sea captains to mark their position uh, along the coast by looking at the colors that may be painted on the lighthouse. Now, not every lighthouse does have a day mark on it, but there are many lighthouses that do. And this is one of the most famous ones right here. I'm sure everybody has seen this at one time or another. This is West Quaddy Head located in Lubeck, Maine. Now, Lubeck, this, this lighthouse actually sits on the easternmost point of the continental United States. If you, the only place you can go farther east in our country would be to go to the Aleutian Islands and go beyond the international date line. There are some islands there. That's the only part of the United States that's farther east than, than this lighthouse. It does have the red and white stripe, which is the day mark, which makes it very recognizable during the day when a ship is going by. And it does have the unique feature of having been the first lighthouse to use a fog bell. Up until this point, they had cannons that they use, which I'm going to talk about later on. But this was the first one to use a fog bell. And when a fog bell was used, eventually the technology did catch up to the fact that a, a clockwork type mechanism was built was housed inside a pyramid shaped tower with the fog belt hanging outside of it. And the keeper of the light could wind that clockwork mechanism and it would either run two and a half to four hours, depending upon how it was constructed. And it would ring the bell, not constantly, but it ring the bell at intervals that are set in order to allow ships in the area to hear the bell and know where the land is and hopefully uh, steer them away from the land in the fog so that they would not be able to uh, 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 crash along the, uh, the coast. So fog bells were very, very important in the, uh, the use of, uh, in the workings of light stations. And if you go to Wood Island Light, which I will talk about again at the end, which is the organization I'm a member of, we have a fog bell there, which is where we begin our tours of going out to the lighthouse. This is another day mark. This is East Quaddy Head Lighthouse, known to Americans as East Quaddy Head, known to Canadians as, as Head Harbor. It's a Canadian lighthouse located not very far from West Quaddy Head in Lubeck, Maine. 
Lubeck is connected by a bridge to Campobello Island and East Quaddy Head Lighthouse or Head Harbor is located at the northern tip of the island. Now I have been out to this island. Uh, it, it looks like an island right now and it is at high tide. It is connected to the land at low tide so you can walk out there, but you have to be very careful about your timing because this is the Bay of Fundy that you're in and you all know of the tides that are there and you could wind up being stuck out at this lighthouse longer than you wish if you don't keep an eye on the, uh, on the tide when it's coming in. This is another famous lighthouse. This is Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, and it has the black and white candy cane design to it. This lighthouse is a, a tall, it's a Southern lighthouse, it's a tall one. The reason is that in order to get a, a, a high focal plane or uh, the plane, the area above uh, sea level, that the light is actually flashing. Down south, they don't have the cliffs along the, uh, the coast the way we do up north. So they had to build lighthouses that are much taller. And this design with the black and white stripe is not unique to Cape Hatteras. If you head south to, uh, to Florida, to uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, to uh, uh, Jacksonville area, you will find uh, another lighthouse, which is down there, which has the exact same uh, stripe, candy cane stripe that uh, this one does. And that's in St. Augustine, Florida. Fresnel lenses. Fresnel lenses are extremely important in lighthouse development. And this is an example of a Fresnel lens right here. The reason it is uh, important is because you have a number of prisms right along in here that are built and installed at an angle to refract the light in a straight line coming away from the lighthouse like this. Now you have the bullseye right here, which has a convex lens and prisms right around it right here, which also refract light going out in a straight direction. And the same thing down here, light will be going in a straight direction in order for it to be concentrated out to sea rather than have light go in multiple directions as it would from an ordinary light bulb. This is Augustine Fresnel. Augustine Fresnel was a French optics genius who invented the Fresnel lenses in 1822. Now they're put together by hundreds of pieces of glass uh, which are comprised uh, into a fixture uh, on the lighthouse, which would be made of prisms and sometimes mirrors, as well as the bullseye lens, which is going to reflect and or refract light in one direction. Now these lenses are both a fixed and a revolving type. Some of them are set in place with a light inside them and the light is on all the time, so the light can be seen in a 360 degree arc from the, uh, the lighthouse. And sometimes they are reflected uh, and, and they move in a, a, a circular motion so that it does send light out to the ocean and it seems to flash at times when it comes directly at the uh, person who is viewing it. Now here's a Fresnel lens and how it works. We have the light source, which is right over here. We have the bullseye, which is right here. We have the prisms, which are all ground into a single piece of glass right here. And this one has mirrors right up here that are going to reflect the light in this direction, going away from the light source in a straight line. Here's a comparison of uh, the lenses. The uh, cross-section of a Fresnel lens is A, and then a, uh, a convex lens of equivalent power in B. Notice how much more glass there is in B, but notice the workmanship that goes into A in order to build it and make it into a, uh, a usable lighthouse or a usable lens for a Fresnel uh, lighthouse uh, lens. This I just add is an extra. This on the left, you have a man by the name of Joseph Smith. He calls himself a performing artist of living history. 
On the right, you have Augustine Fresnel. I have seen Mr. Smith perform, and he impersonates Augustine Fresnel in a very nice program talking about lighthouses and the construction of them at the time. If you look at this lighthouse behind him, you have what appears to be a first order lighthouse. And I'll get into the orders in just a moment. But your prisms are right up at the top here. You can see how they are bent and how they will all refract light in one direction. We have multiple bullseyes. This appears to be a six sided first order lens with a bullseye right here and then the prisms around it and then the prisms at the bottom. You can see between the prisms, you can see between the prisms right down here and actually see into the light so the prisms don't touch each other at that point. Any uh, questions yet at this point, Fufi? Not yet. I think uh, everyone's still digesting all this information. Okay. Uh, close up view of a Fresnel lens. This is what they look like when you're really close to them. To review, they have a multiple prism design on them. They focus the light in one direction. And this is new information. The effective range is going to be dependent upon the order of the lenses. So I'll go into the order of lenses right now and that will determine the size of the lenses. When they were originally built, Fresnel lenses were of six sizes or orders, one, two, three, four, five, and six, one being the largest and six being the smallest. The larger lenses like one, two, three would be used on coastal lighthouses and the smaller lenses four, five, and six would be used on uh, river lighthouses or on harbor lights. Eventually there was a seventh uh, one that was built, the seventh and eighth orders. And then there is an intermediate three and a half order lens. That became very popular. The seventh and eighth orders did not, but on the other end, those were very small. On the other side though, we had mesoradial and hyperradial which were huge ones. And here's some information on some hyperradial lenses. Now this graphic that I have does say that there were about a dozen of these uh, large hyperradial lenses built. Another source that I have uh, stated that there were uh, about double that number, about 25 or so that were built. Nevertheless, they were very, uh, very few of them used in the world, and they were built uh, and used very far apart. There was only one hyperradial lens ever used in the United States, and that was on the island of Oahu at Makapu Point Lighthouse in, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, the other light one I want to draw your attention to is the Bishop's Rock Lighthouse off the coast of Cornwall in the UK because I do have a picture of that. And my, my something is happening, okay. This is Bishop's Rock hyperradial lens off of uh, the coast of uh, Cornwall in England off the Cornish coast. Uh, and you notice it's a five pointed, a uh, five sided lighthouse. You can see the bullseye right in there and you can see the uh, prisms that are right in here. This one is the one that was used in Hawaii. Now we don't know the height of this man, but this lighthouse, this uh, Fresnel lens would be somewhere between uh, 15 and 18 feet, I would assume. This, this is a comparison chart of the lenses. Notice in here in the middle, we have the three and a half order. These are the seven lenses that were most widely used in lighthouses. Again, the, the first order is the largest, the sixth order is the smallest, and everything in between was used depending upon uh, the distance that the light needed to be uh, carried in order to do the uh, optimum uh, job for the, uh, the lighthouse. 
we have bivalve, bivalve and beehive lenses. That's the shape of the lens. And this one is a beehive lens named that way because it looks like a beehive. Now this light that you see uh, has, it, the light does not revolve. It would be a fixed light, but you can see 360 degrees uh, to the light because of the, the, the round shape of it. And this was manufactured in multiple orders. Now this light is located in the Navisink, New Jersey Lighthouse Museum. You can look out the window there and just see uh, some water. That's the Atlantic Ocean there. This is northern part of New Jersey where Navisink was located. I do have a picture of that coming up. And it was uh, quite the lighthouse. This is an absolutely beautiful piece of art. This is a first order beehive style Fresnel lens that is in the Ponce Inlet Lighthouse Museum in Daytona, Florida. I, when I took this picture, I was just in awe of the construction that went into this light and how beautiful that light is. On a sad note though, uh, if you go north to St. Augustine Lighthouse, there is a similar light that was there, uh, that is still there in the uh, St. Augustine Lighthouse. But I was there at a time uh, visiting it with a cousin of mine, just after somebody uh, from a distance with a high powered rifle had shot through the glass of the tower room of the uh, lantern room and right into the lens and destroyed some of the prisms that were in there. It was just wanton destruction of a beautiful piece of art. But uh, they also had a great deal of difficulty finding anybody who could cut new prisons for them. But uh, eventually they did and it has been restored, I understand. This is a bivalve lens. This would be probably a sixth order bivalve lens. It is uh, named that because it has a similar design to a marine bivalve. Think of a clamshell when you're looking at this. Uh, the light source is between the, the two uh, sides of it. And these also were constructed in multiple orders. And this one is a first order bivalve lens in the same museum, uh, the Navisink New Jersey Lighthouse Museum. Uh, looking at it from the side, you can see the light source, which is inside there, and the two lenses on the, the left and the right of the light source. That light that's in there, uh, I'm only taking an educated guess on there, but that does not have very high wattage because of the size of the lens here. Uh, in our lighthouse in, uh, in uh, Biddeford Pool, Maine, we now have the Coast Guard has put in LED lights into that lighthouse, but the last lens that was there required only a 30 watt bulb in order to uh, generate enough light for the lens to be shot about uh, 18 to 20 miles out to sea. And that was because of the construction of the uh, lenses around it. Going into lighthouses that we have in America, I'm gonna talk about some different lighthouses, some of the important ones. There are many lighthouses in our country, uh, but we'll stick right around in the New England area and uh, the northern part of New Jersey. Here's the first light. This is the first place that a lighthouse was built. It's Boston Light in uh, Boston Harbor, not far from where you're located right now. And this was built on Little Brewster Island, in Boston Harbor in 1716. And that light was the first one to have a cannon installed there in 1719. That was the uh, first fog signal. Now, remember I talked before about 1820, the fog bell that was used at uh, uh, West Quaddy Head Lighthouse in Lubeck, Maine. This is the first time a cannon was used. Now it wasn't shot off continuously. It was shot off about every half an hour in order to uh, let ships know where the land was because they could do it at that time period because uh, as you know, ships are either gonna be at anchor or they're gonna be traveling very, very slowly when they're in fog. And think of the keeper too on the island. If you have fog, let's say it goes for five days and he has to keep this cannon going 
every half hour for five days, that's quite a job. And he's going to need some sort of help, which usually came from a family member who was unusually the keeper's wife also was trained in doing the job of being a keeper. Now we get into the history of this poor lighthouse because of what was going on in Boston in 1775 and up to 1781, we had the uh, Revolutionary War. And the British uh, controlled Boston in 1775, as you know, and the tower was burned down by the colonial army, rebuilt by the British and burned again by the colonials in order to try and disrupt the commerce, the trade, the ships coming in and out of the British ships coming in and out of Boston Harbor at the time. In 1776, the tower was blown up by the British army when they evacuated Boston Harbor. And the island was left that way until 1783 after the war was over. Now, John Hancock was the governor of Massachusetts at that time. And he's the one that ordered that a new tower be built. Now, if you remember from history, during the seven, early 1780s, we were a country that was working under the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation gave a great deal of power to the states, but we had a very weak central government at that time. And that's why it remained until 1789 when the federal government began to operate under the constitution. Now, at this point in time, they created, the federal government created what was known as the lighthouse establishment. And the lighthouse establishment took control of all lighthouses in the country at that point in time. And it was not at all uh, unreasonable for the president of the United States, in this case, George Washington, to get involved in the building of light, lighthouses, the siting of them, choosing locations where they're going to be built and so forth. And that's exactly what, uh, what went on here. And the lighthouse and other locations was already chosen, uh, but a new lighthouse was raised and it was uh, raised to the height of 89 feet in 1859. Uh, new tower room, constructed new home, 12-sided uh, second order Fresnel lens. It was also a tower lined with brick. And you can see that if you go to our lighthouse too, Wood Island Lighthouse, it is a rubble stone tower on the outside, but it is also lined with brick when that tower was built in uh, 1858. Now, the keeper's house here constructed in 1859, along with uh, two assistant keepers and uh, a full time keeper in order to man this lighthouse. That was a large complement of people in order to keep a lighthouse going. Ordinarily, it was just one keeper and his family that was going to be doing the job. But this lighthouse was considered to be so important that it did uh, allow for the assistant keepers and uh, others to keep the, the light going. It does have a second order Fresnel lens, which is going to send the uh, the light out 27 miles to sea, which is a good distance for it to go in order for ships to be able to pick it up as they come into Boston Harbor. Now, this is what makes you uh, Boston Light the most one of the most unique lighthouses in the United States, in that it is the only lighthouse that is manned on a 24-7, 365 uh, schedule. The Coast Guard maintains a crew of light keepers on the island in order to uh, pay homage to the past light keepers who have stayed at their posts during terrible storms and even some who died at their posts in maintaining lights over the years. In the 1990s, the last of the lighthouses in the United States was automated. And at that point in time, uh, there was no longer a need for the Coast Guard to maintain people on the island. The Coast Guard became involved in light keeping in 1939 when the Lighthouse Establishment, which had become the United States Lighthouse Service, uh, the Lighthouse Service ceased to be and was rolled into the Coast Guard. And people who were light keepers at that point 
could uh, stay on with the Coast Guard. Some of them were offered jobs uh, to enlist in the Coast Guard and continue maintaining their, their lights. This is Navasink, New Jersey, and that's quite a place. It looks like a castle. Uh, this is a double light setup. It only uses one light right now, but it was, uh, it's up on a, a high hill so that there, the lights are travel, go out to sea quite a bit. One of the reasons for the double light was that you would be able to, you meaning a, a helmsman or a captain of a ship, be able to determine where they are along the coast by the two lights being worked uh, in concert right next to each other. So that's why in some places they did have two lights. Now, Navisync is important for all of the other firsts that happened there. Another, uh, the first Fresnel lens in the United States, the first fuel by kerosene. It was one of the first that was uh, uh, switched over to electricity that used electricity in order to light the lights. In the 1930s, they had secret uh, uh, government experiments were going on there where they were shooting invisible rays out into the ocean and getting them to bounce back. And, and that is what we eventually be called radar. So that was one place where radar was being tested in order to, because of the height there and its direct uh, view out into the Atlantic Ocean. This is Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Sandy Hook is down the hill and up the coast a little bit from Navisink. Now, you look at this thing and you look at the background behind the lighthouse and you say, why in the world would anybody build a lighthouse in the middle of the woods? And that answer is coming up. But first, this is the oldest. This is what you see there is the original lighthouse built in 1674. It is the oldest continuously used lighthouse in the United States. It's located at the Southern entrance to New York and it was actually funded by the New York assembly back in the 1700s because it was the light that lit the way into New York Harbor and it still is one of the lights that does so. Uh, another light that lights the way into it, most people don't think of it as a lighthouse, but it is, and that is the Statue of Liberty. That is considered to be a lighthouse. Now, why was it built in the middle of the woods? The answer is it wasn't. When it was originally built, it was 500 feet from the tip of Sandy Hook. But because of currents, tides, and the shore drift, that has taken place over the last couple hundred years, uh, this lighthouse is now 1.5 miles from the tip of Sandy Hook. But that's not 1.5 miles of wasteland there. If you want to go and visit it, you can drive around that 1.5 miles and you can drive through the streets. It is the, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the fort, but it is a, uh, a, a fort, a World War II era fort, which is no longer commissioned but it is open to the public to drive around if you want to. Now the tower there has a third order lens and an effective range of 19 miles out to sea, which is still a, a pretty good distance for a light to be traveling there. Any questions at this point in time from anybody? Yeah, we have a number of questions actually. Uh, okay. First up from Belinda, are the lenses heavy? The, yes, uh, the smaller ones like the seventh order, the, the sixth order lens is something, the one, the small ones you saw is something a person could pick up. If you're talking about the large ones, uh, no, a person cannot lift them up at all. They're made of solid glass and they are works of art. Uh, they're actually valued, uh, some of the, the first order lenses, over a million dollars today, uh, but they are very heavy and they have to be moved very, very carefully, but they do come apart. So when they do need to be moved, you can take out the prisms uh, in order and then put them back in the same order, which makes it easier to move them, but I'm not gonna to try to move them too heavy. <laughs> All right, uh, so the sort of 
follow up question to that. Uh, do the fixtures require more than one person to is install them? How does installation go? Uh, I'm not too familiar with the installation, but I would say yes, it would be more than one person who's going to have to do it. Uh, you got to put everything in in the exact order at the exact angles. The uh, prisms, which are divide, uh, designed to slide in, the metal that they slide into has to be at the perfect angle in order for the, uh, the prism to refract the light at the exact angle that it's designed uh, to work so they don't give you the optimum efficiency. Uh, so I would say, yes, there are going to be a number. You're going to need at least two people, probably more, in order to install a large one. Not the same with the smaller ones. Cool. Uh, and then next up from Wendy, um, is it the responsibility of the keeper if they in fact still, uh, for the ones that still have them, to clean and maintain these lenses? There and are no every. Go ahead. And, I'm sorry. Uh, does every lighthouse have a keeper? I guess uh, in terms of bef before they were automated. Before they were automated and when lighthouses had a keeper, yes, it was their job to do everything. They had to maintain the glass on the outside. They had to paint the towers. They had to keep the house painted. And in addition, many keepers were also farmers. Uh, back in the 1800s, they raised some of their own food. So they had farm animals. They had to maintain the, the farm animals. They had uh, barns, our lighthouse in Maine, uh, we have, pictures of it with the barn that was still there that uh, it was used at one time. So keepers were responsible for everything. And there were supervisors that came around periodically in order to check on the keepers to make sure the keepers were maintaining their lights and that the, the lenses were cleaned uh, often, that the glass in the uh, uh, round and lantern tower was cleaned often so that uh, there wasn't dirt on there, which would impede the, uh, the light flowing out to sea. And the keepers were very, very busy people, yes, when they did have them. Nowadays, there are no keepers anywhere except at Boston Light. So the job of maintaining all of that, uh, in our case at Wood Island Light, falls to us, the people who are members of it. Uh, we have an organization uh, known as the Friends of Wood Island Light. We have people who are known as the Woodchucks and the Woodchicks. And I've been a, a woodchuck since uh, 2004. And we're the ones that cut the grass around there. The woodchicks take care of the flowers. Uh, they will take care of the inside of the house. They help on the outside. Uh, everybody chips in. And it is our job to maintain everything to do with that lighthouse, except the light itself and the uh, fog signal. That would be the job of the United States Coast Guard. They're the only ones that touch that. That's incredible. Uh, and then uh, last couple questions for now uh, from Anthony. First up, do you know how keepers were paid back in the colonial era? And were they, and the second question to it is, were they hired by the town or trading companies? Well, the keepers were hired by the state uh, or whoever was in charge of the lighthouses at that time, prior to the uh, uh, 1789 when the constitution went into effect, it was each state who was in charge of the lighthouses that were in that state and they would have some type of a board or some organization that would be in charge of them and hire the keepers. Generally, they, they, could, uh, they were often local people who were given the job of maintaining the light but it was a full-time job for them. And it was often a job uh, that was passed down from father to son or father to daughter. Uh, there were women who were lighthouse keepers. Uh, they often took over from their husbands or in some cases, uh, their fathers. So that's how they got to be that, uh, those keepers. When uh, the federal government came into being in 1789, that was when the United States Lighthouse Establishment was uh, organized and people became employees of that organization and they were paid whatever the amount of money was that they signed on for. Uh, it may be $500 a year 
that they would earn as their uh, their pay for for working at a lighthouse and maintaining it. But they also had a home that they could live in, but they also had to maintain that house themselves too. So I hope that pretty much answers those questions. Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Uh, and we can uh, move on and we'll just uh, see if anyone has more questions about the next section. Okay, moving on now. This is Avery Point Lighthouse. It is probably the most unique lighthouse in the United States. And it's located in Groton, Connecticut at the Yukon Avery Point campus. Uh, it is not a very big lighthouse, as you can see. There is no keeper's quarters, and you may wonder why. And the reason was it was never intended to be an aid to navigation, which is what lighthouses are. Instead, Avery Point was built as a memorial or a tribute to all of the uh, lighthouses and lighthouse keepers of the past. And that's why it, uh, it, it exists. And there really isn't a need for it where it's located. I've been there many times. Uh, I live in Connecticut. Uh, so I've been to Avery Point many times and looked at it. But this is a little bit of the history of it. Uh, it was built on its location because the Coast Guard used to have a major Coast Guard facility right at Avery Point, which is part of the town of Groton, Connecticut right across the, uh, uh, the Thames River from New London. Uh, when the Coast Guard moved to Governor's Island in New York, uh, they abandoned the lighthouse and it was in a state of disrepair in 1999 and 2000 when restoration began on the lighthouse by the Avery Point Lighthouse Society. Now that is a sister organization to the uh, Friends of Wood Island Light in that we are both offshoots of the American Lighthouse Foundation, which is located uh, in Owl's Head Lighthouse, actually in Owl's Head, Maine, which is right in the Rockland area of Maine. Uh, so this lighthouse uh, that is there, as it states here, was relit on uh, October 15, 2006, which happens to be my wife's birthday but I don't think that they relit it in her honor. I think it was just done at that point. Uh, but it was uh, relit and it is visible today and you can go and, and visit it. And if you go there, uh, take a picture of the lighthouse as I did, and then turn around 180 degrees, you get a picture of a house uh, in, in uh, Avery Point, which I'm part owner of. And that's this house right here. And the reason I'm part owner of this house is because I am a genuine certified taxpayer in the state of Connecticut. And this house is owned by the state of Connecticut. It's on the Yukon campus and it's used by Yukon for official functions. So I have been to that house often, but I've only looked in the windows. Uh, as of this point in time, I can't get any keys. No one will give me a set of keys to get in there myself. But the house was built in 1902 for Morton uh, Freeman Plant, who was an industrialist. He was into uh, railroads, shipping, and so forth. And the interesting thing about it uh, is his wife, Nellie, is the one who designed it. Now, she just didn't sit down with a piece of paper and say, draw a sketch and say, well, this is what I want my house to look like. She designed it. She was a trained architect. She uh, learned her craft uh, at the Sorbonne in Paris. And she was the one who did design the building, which cost $3 million at that time, 70 million in today's money. It was their second home, but it was originally a 70 acre farm. And it's known as Branford House because they live in Branford, Connecticut, which is only about a half hour away down I-95 right now. But in those days, it was quite a distance to travel. So they would go to this house at some points in time and and it was their second home, as I said, and they would take their family and they would go to their country farm and, uh, and enjoy some time right by the water. Here we have a unusual set of lighthouses. We have the Kennebec range lights on the Kennebec River in Maine. These are lighthouses right here, these two lighthouses. These are the only set of range lights that are in the state of Maine. 
of the 64 lighthouses that are there. And 1892 and 1898 were very important in the history of the Kennebec River uh, because that was when not only was the doubling was Doubling Point Lighthouse built, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, but the range lights were built. Uh, Perkins Island Lighthouse was built farther down the river, as was Squirrel Point Lighthouse. And the Kennebec opens up right into the Atlantic Ocean. There is a lighthouse right there named Bond Island. And two miles out to sea is Seguin, which is one of the first lighthouses built in Maine. And it has a second order Fresnel lens still in it to this day. Now, the reason that uh, 1892 and 98 is important because 1892 is when they began talking about the building of these lighthouses. 1898 was when it actually took place and they built all the lighthouses that I just talked about other than Pond Island and Seguin. Those go back uh, many years before that. Now the front lighthouse here, the, what, the important thing about range lights is to know about the height of them. So looking here at the front lighthouse right here, this is 18 feet above mean high tide. And this one is 33 feet above mean high tide, which means that there is a 15 foot difference in the height of those lighthouses. And that comes, uh, becomes important because those being range lights, they help a uh, river pilot navigate his way up the river. Now, the reason that this river is so important is because just beyond these, these uh, range lights is Bath Ironworks. In the 1870s, it uh, began building ships. By the 1890s, it was building warships for the United States Navy. And today, uh, BIW is one of the two yards in the country that builds destroyers for the United States Navy, the other being Ingalls in Pascagoula, Mississippi. So that means that the Kennebec River is very important to the security of the United States in that there has to be a free flow of uh, shipping that goes on in there. Those destroyers, when they come in for service or if they are being launched, need to get out as soon as they can. An example of that happened uh, just last week when there was a uh, over 100 year old uh, sailing ship that had, I think it was 16 passengers on it that capsized in the Kennebec River right in front of the Maine Maritime Museum, which is right next to Bath Ironworks. The Coast Guard got into there immediately and it took them only a few days to uh, right that ship and tow it out of the way just in case of an emergency, in case uh, a destroyer needed to get in or out of that area. Uh, it was very important that they, they do that. But how did they go about doing that? Well, this is what's known as Fiddler's Reach. And this is how range lights come into being. When you look at the range lights, the first light is located right here. The second light is located right up here. And as a ship is coming up Fiddler's Reach like this, the pilot of the ship is going to keep the two lights ahead of him, one directly above the other. That's why there's a 15 foot difference between these two lights. So by keeping them lined up one above the other, the pilot is able to keep the ship on a straight course safely getting through Fiddler's Reach. Now to port is land and it continues to be land and it continues to be land. And if the pilot doesn't move, doesn't turn to port, then the pilot's going to crash right into the land right here and into the first light. So how does the pilot know when to turn to port? And the answer is doubling point light right here. So as a pilot is coming up here, he can only see land to port, land to port right here. As he gets to this point, he can see doubling point light over here, which means it's time for me to turn 90 degrees to port and head towards this lighthouse. And that's how the lighthouses work with each other in order to get 
a pilot a ship through this particular area right here. That's not supposed to happen. So going on to here at Fiddler's Reach, as you travel around the corner here, you have Maine Maritime Museum right over in that point. Uh, Bath Iron Works right ahead. For some reason, it likes to move at this point on its own. And I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, and then just above Bath Iron Works is the city of Bath, Maine. So that is the area that you are located in right at this point in time. If you've ever been to that area and seen those uh, attractions, this is the point that we're at. Doubling Point Light is directly across from Maine Maritime Museum. And this is what Doubling Point Light does look like. That keeper's house that you see in the back there is a keeper's house for both the range lights and Doubling Point Light. So this light station had three lighthouses there that the keeper had to maintain. And here are some facts about Dublin Point Light. Again, 1992 was when it was designed and, and talked about. 1998 was when it was built and wood. It was made out of wood. All of the lighthouses along the Kennebec River were made out of wood in 1998 and they are still standing today. The light could be seen about nine mile nautical miles, which is not a lot uh, because it is a river lighthouse and you just need uh, to be able to see it up and down the river. The original Fresnel lens, which is uh, was at the, the lighthouse, is supposed to be at the main lighthouse museum. I did go to there. I did ask if I could see the, the light that was there, but unfortunately the person that I spoke to didn't know which light they did have, which third order lens they did have was the one that was a doubling point lighthouse. But still it's a worth, if you're a lighthouse enthusiast, it's well worth the time to go to the main lighthouse museum in Rockland. Now, any questions at this point, Fufi, before we go into uh, talking about lighthouse visiting? Uh, no questions just yet, but John did drop into the chat a link for uh, Fresnel lenses, order sizes, uh, weights, and quantities, if anyone's curious about those lenses and wants oh. some more reading. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. Now, the reason this says visiting lighthouses easily accessible to Ocean Park is because Ocean Park, Maine, part of Old Orchard Beach is where I have a home and it is very accessible to Wood Island Lighthouse, the organization that I represent here and the one to which I am a, a member where I am a woodchuck as well as a, a, a docent. And I, I take people on tours out to the lighthouse. Uh, Ocean Park uh, is located just south of Old Orchard Beach, but it is part of the town of uh, Old Orchard Beach. And I have given this lighthouse tour uh, most recently to people in Ocean Park. And that's why I geared it towards them. This is Cape Elizabeth or also known as two lights. On the left, you have a picture I took of Cape Elizabeth Lighthouse. That is the light which is uh, lit today, which you can see. On the right, you have the two lights there. The one in the foreground is the same lighthouse that you see on the left-hand picture. And the one in the background is still standing. It does not have a lantern room in it anymore. And it is privately owned and it is not lit nor is it in any way maintained by the Coast Guard. But this is an example of two lights that are put together uh, as we had seen earlier in Navasink, New Jersey. And this was, uh, uh, ship captains were able to know their uh, area by the two lights that were together. As I said, this was not uncommon. If you've been to Chatham, Massachusetts, right on the elbow of the Cape at the uh, uh, Chatham Light, you will see one light standing there and the uh, foundation for a second light. That light was removed a number of years ago and moved to Nauset, Massachusetts, where it was placed and was put into service at that point. 
and then it had to be moved back because of erosion. Erosion, it's being moved, uh, it was moved back from, uh, from the cliffs so that it would continue to survive. If you go to Nauset, behind Nauset in a field, there are three small lighthouses together there known as the Three Sisters. They used to be on the forearm of the Cape too, between Chatham and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the tip of the Cape. And you would be able to see those three lights together, short lights uh, being able to, as, tra as you were traveling up the Cape and you were heading uh, around the Cape into Boston or wherever you were going. So that's why they had multiple lights in some locations in order to help uh, people to find uh, uh, ship captains to know the uh, area that they were going to be uh, sailing in. This is the granddaddy of all the lighthouses. Everybody's seen this picture before one time or another. This is the Portland Head Light Station. And it is the most photographed or supposedly the most photographed lighthouse in the United States. And everybody's drawn to this picture because it's such a beautiful picture and hardly anybody looks at this lighthouse right over here. And that is Ram Island Ledge Lighthouse, which is right here on the right. Now Ram Island Ledge is a privately owned lighthouse, but between the, these two lighthouses travels all of the ships that are going into Portland Harbor in Maine. And there, this is important uh, in the days of sail because that's where uh, ships are going to be heading. The two lights together are lighting the way to get into the lighthouse. So you had the two lights at Cape Elizabeth, and then you had two lights much farther apart though than at Cape Elizabeth that led the way into Portland Harbor. The one on the left is a halfway rock lighthouse, which can be seen on a clear day from uh, Portland Headlight. And that one is heading halfway up to Booth Bay Harbor. That's how it gets its name. Looking into Portland Harbor from Portland Light, you can see these lighthouses. Well, looking south, you're going to see Cape Elizabeth, the one I just talked about. But the one that you see here, Spring Point Ledge, is a lighthouse which is lighting uh, the inner harbor of Portland. That's why it's a small, it's uh, called a caisson or a spark plug type lighthouse because it looks like a spark plug and that's where it gets its name, but it's a caisson type and it is not, does not have a powerful lens in it, but it doesn't need one because it is a harbor lighthouse. And then farther on in, you get into Portland breakwater or also known as bug light. And this light also has a small light in it, but it is the closest one to the actual waterfront of Portland Harbor. If you go to Maine Maritime Museum, that is doubling point light, which we just talked about behind you. They do have lighthouse cruises that you can take going down the Kennebec River. And the uh, Maine uh, Maritime Museum does uh, still do those cruises this summer. I know of people who have gone on them. Uh, and that's a number for the uh, lighthouse, for the uh, museum, if you're interested and you could find out about departure time in that area. Here's a couple of outer town lighthouses that I just threw in. Howarth Head Lighthouse in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I found this one quite by accident. My wife and I were in Ireland almost two years ago. We stopped for a break and I looked down and there's this lighthouse. I had no idea what it was. I took a picture of it and I blew it up here. Uh, it's actually quite farther away than where I was standing on this one. And then I went into uh, my reference books to look up and see which lighthouse it was. And this is Howth Head in uh, Dublin, Ireland at the open, the mouth of uh, Dublin Harbor. Marlariff Lighthouse in Iceland. This picture was given to me by my daughter and she and her husband went to Iceland about two or three weeks after my wife and I went to Dublin, Ireland almost two years ago. And she gave me this picture uh, and I had to look that up. Uh, one of the, the best part about her going to Ireland though was the fact that uh, as she traveled from Colorado here to Connecticut to uh, get over to Iceland, she dropped off her two kids and my wife and I had uh, a ball with her two grandchildren, 
from Colorado uh, for the time that they were gone in Iceland. And now we get to the lighthouse that I represent. This is Wood Island Light Station. It is located in Biddeford Pool, Maine. The lighthouse was uh, restored. As you take a look at it now, that is exactly what it looked like in the year 1906. When we got this lighthouse through the Lighthouse Preservation Act of, I think it was 1992, we took control of this in the year 2003 uh, through when the American Lighthouse Foundation got a lease from the Coast Guard to uh, lease the eight acres this lighthouse is on, plus the boardwalk and the boathouse, which you'll see in a moment, uh, that uh, get you to the lighthouse across the yard. Uh, we, took we took it over and we started right in on working at this lighthouse. I was the first person, uh, I believe, to put a broom to the porch on this lighthouse uh, between 1986 when the last keeper left and the lighthouse was uh, uh, automated and 2004 when we went into the lighthouse and we started to clean it for the first time. The uh, tower that you see there is the third incarnation. The first one built in, 19, in 1808 was a wooden tower. It lasted about 20 years. Uh, the next tower lasted about 30 years. And this one was built in uh, 1858. It's a rubble stone tower lined with brick on the inside. And uh, the lantern room is relatively new, though the Coast Guard rebuilt that lantern room after the original lantern room was destroyed many years ago. Uh, the Coast Guard put that on in, uh, in uh, the late 1990s, I believe. Now, it's located in Biddeford Pool. Just as an aside, Biddeford Pool is where Maine actually began. The first permanent settlement in Maine, uh, 1616, was when Richard Vines, an explorer, wintered in what was called Winter Harbor. At that time, it is now Biddeford Pool Harbor uh, with his uh, party. And they came ashore in 1616. <coughs> and And they established a colony in what is now Biddeford Pool. That was the first permanent establishment in Maine. And in, in uh, 1635, they wrote down a set of laws by which they were going to be governed. So it was the first uh, area in, in Maine to actually write a set of laws for governing the people who lived within that jurisdiction. So the tower, is, uh, as I said, built in 1808. Uh, totally refurbished to what it looked like in 1906. There are tours available. This is uh, our website. You can go to woodislandlighthouse.org and click on tours. You can make a reservation online, uh, but there is no charge for the tours. Donations are accepted though. And uh, that may be changing when we get licensed captains who are going to uh, uh, man the boat and we'll be able to do tours more often than we can right now because we don't have as many captains as we need in order to uh, meet the need of people who want a tour of the lighthouse. This is Saco Bay and this is where the lighthouse is. I'm going to try not to skip any slides here. If you've been to Old Orchard Beach, this is the pier in Old Orchard Beach. This is Ocean Park. That's what I was trying not to do. And this is Wood Island right up here. The lighthouse is located at this end. The boathouse is located at that end. And this is what the island looks like. The boathouse is located down at the bottom right here. This is an elevated wooden walkway about four feet, four feet wide. It goes the entire length of the island. And at the other end, you have Wood Island Light Station, which today consists of the lighthouse, the light tower, and this building right here, which is the oil house. The oil house is today the domain of the woodchucks because that's where all of the lawnmowers and the uh, 
gear used in order to keep the area around the lighthouse spruced up uh, is all kept in the oil house now. And that is the end of the program that I do have. And I'll be glad to take any questions that anybody does have at this time. Uh, we have uh, a few questions. Uh, did the bath range lights being 15 feet different in height not play a part in signaling when making the port turn towards the sea? No, they didn't make any, uh, they didn't play any part in turning to port at that point. It was a single doubling point light. Seeing that uh, was a signal for the pilot to know that he could turn at that point to port. Prior to that, there was land to port, which you may not see in the darkness because there wouldn't be any lights on that area. Uh, but it was that one light, a doubling point light that allowed him to know that it was now safe to make a, a port turn of 90 degrees in order to uh, bring your ship on into the uh, city of Bath. All right. Uh, and Diane asks, what inspired your interest in lighthouses? Uh, how many have you visited? And then uh, afterwards, there's another follow-up question, but I'll, I'll let you answer those two first. Okay. I grew up with Wood Island Lighthouse. The home that I have in Ocean Park uh, is right next door to one that my grandparents bought right after World War II. And I started going there as a child. I'm 70 years old now. So I've been going there for 70 years. And in 1971, my parents bought the house that I now own. So I've seen that lighthouse. It's three and a half miles from my house. I can see it from my bedroom, from the deck, from the living room, uh, and definitely from the beach. And I always had uh, an interest in that lighthouse. Uh, and then as I got older, I began to collect lighthouses. There are Harbor Lights brand lighthouses. I have about 64 in my collection. And I collected those lighthouses and uh, I used to uh, kidnap my wife and put her in the car and drive her, uh, put a blindfold on her so she didn't know where she was going. And we'd wind up at a lighthouse someplace. And she'd say, oh, not again, but uh, we would go and look at that lighthouse. So we, was uh, I used to go in and visit the lighthouses that I had in my collection. So as many that I have visited, uh, I can't keep track. I, I don't know, it's, it's in the dozens that I've actually been to. Uh, and uh, my wife uh, actually does go willingly to a lot of the, uh, when I do wanna go to see some lighthouses. She uh, is one that, that will do that because I am willing to go into quilting stores with her uh, whenever she wants to stop and see one. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship that we do have there. But uh, that's how my interest began. And uh, just going to see them, I'm interested in the history of it. I have always enjoyed United States history. I at one time thought about being a history teacher, but uh, because there really weren't jobs in that area, I became a special education teacher where I know there were plenty of jobs. And uh, I'm still at that job today, still working as a, this time as a professor of special education. But uh, uh, that's, uh, that's basically how I got my interest in it. So was there another part to that also? Uh, yes. Can you speak a bit about the lore and documented sightings of ghosts and hauntings at lighthouses? <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> I can only tell you what I have read. I have no first-hand experience. I do know that New London Ledge Lighthouse, uh, which is the, at the mouth of New London Harbor, is supposed to be the most haunted lighthouse in America. I do know that there, the New England Ghost Project did spend some time in Wood Island Light. They concluded that there is a ghost who is in Wood Island Lighthouse. They don't know exactly where or who the ghost is, it could have something to do with a uh, murder-suicide that took place on the light on the island back in, uh, I think it was 1898. Uh, but that had nothing really to do with the lighthouse other than they ran for help to the lighthouse, to the lighthouse keeper uh, at the time. 
Um, but I also know that they're a member of our organization named Russ Lowell. Uh, Russ is a former Coast Guardsman and a former keeper of Wood Island Light. He and his wife were stationed there for about three years. They did go into the keeper's house, not believing in ghosts, and they came out of the keeper's house firmly believing in ghosts because of uh, very strange happenings that took place there. Uh, Russ is one of our captains. He does, from time to time, tell ghost stories on the uh, boat. It's about a 10 minute boat ride leading, leaving from Vines Landing in Biddeford Pool to go out to the lighthouse. And he does sometimes tell ghost stories, but once he gets to the lighthouse, he will not tell any more ghost stories or even mention the ghost. When he, the boat is either in contact with the uh, boat ramp or when he is on the island itself. So he refuses to do that. Uh, he has his reasons why, but uh, it's, it has to do with the ghost that apparently lives in the, the lighthouse. And there are members of our organization who did not believe in ghosts, who now uh, strange things have happened that they have observed on the island and they, which they cannot explain. So uh, they do believe there could be something supernatural that is out there. But as I said, I have no firsthand experience. Awesome, thanks. And on that spooky note, uh, I think we will wrap up this presentation since there's no more questions in the chat. Right. Okay. Thank you well, so much. Well, thank you for inviting me.